Hey, you guys, this is Josh and Carolyn with Homesteading Family, and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. This week, we're going to be talking about starting out on a new piece of property, right? That's right. So you have got your property, you're getting ready to move in, and what are the things you need to do to get going? All right, so you've got your new homestead, your new place in the country. You've done all your research. You mm -hmm. bought that, you know, hopefully great piece of property. And now you're getting ready to move in and you've probably got a whole lot of things you're excited about and interested to do and just ready to go on a new journey. Yeah, so you're gonna put orchards in and get a milk cow. And get the garden, garden in, in get, get some get cows out on pasture. Bees, you're gonna do all that next month, right? Right, you're gonna do it all at once. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> But so, sorry, today we will be talking about what we should be doing right when you get onto a piece of property. Right. We're yeah. going to give you some steps to help you make sure that you're going to be successful as you get landed in the country and you start to take off on this journey. Right. But hey, before we get into that, we mm -hmm. would like to do a little chit chat, we call it, and catch up with what's going on with Carolyn and I. Yeah. And so, Carolyn, what is up with you? What's happening right now? <laughs> Well, we really are still right in the heart of home of harvesting season and preserving season, which gets kind of crazy in the kitchen sometimes. Yeah. You know, the kitchen floor is just always muddy this time of year. <laughs> it's a wreck <laughs> because we're, we're bringing produce in and we're canning it or we're fermenting it. We're putting up in all these different ways. So it's really a fun time of year, but it's a very busy and tiring time of year too. So right now... My big things that I'm bringing in this week are cucumbers and green beans still. I think that's what I said last week too, but that's, that's still what's happening. Well, that's on the preserving side of things. I mean, yes. there's a lot of other stuff coming in that we're eating. Right. right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We have a lot of fresh eating. Yeah, happening. potatoes, yeah. onions, carrots. Yeah, those carrots are so beautiful charred, this year. They did a spinach. great job on the carrots. But um, but on the preserving side, we're doing a yeah. lot of the green beans and the cucumbers. And, you know, I think I might have talked about this in one of the last episodes, but I'm okay. on a mission this year to trial all sorts of different methods of pickling to really find a canned pickle, not a fermented pickle, but a canned pickle that will stay really, really crispy on the shelf, Ooh. hopefully for 12 months. Now, that's a trick because, you know, pickles kind of start getting soft mm -hmm. as they sit longer and longer. So I'm I'm trying all different methods. and. Um, one of the methods I'm trying is something called low temperature pasteurization. It's an approved canning method, but instead of bringing that canning, that water bath canner all the way up to a rolling boil, like you do with every other canning, you hold it at 180 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. That's hard to do. <laughs> you have to make sure it stays at between 180 and 185 for wow, 30 minutes. Tight. So one of the tricks that I learned about was using an electric water bath canner. I have never used one of those. I've never had one for all the canning. No, we, done. we never have. So I'm kind of excited because I have one coming right now. They're a little hard to find at the moment. Everything's out of stock, you know, but I did find one and it's on its way. And I'm going to be making good use out of that. All right. So, yeah. So that's well, what hopefully it gets here and it doesn't do what our milk refrigerator has oh, done gosh. that we ordered three months ago. Are you guys experiencing this? Yeah. And it's just the way things are right now. And it's a it's a good reminder to really you got to think way out ahead yeah. right now because it's going to stay this way for a while. Yes. And it is just hard to get things. We've been waiting for a particular type of fridge that we ordered just mm -hmm. for our milk. No freezer attached upright. And normally you get that in a few weeks and it's been, I think we're going on four months. Yeah. It's been yeah, a long right. time. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope that gets here because I'm excited about, so. I'm excited about the crunchy pickles in winter. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Oh, good. Good. What have you been up to? Wow. Well, you know, mostly the addition. We've got yeah. that addition going and we've got a friend here from out of state and his son helping out and all the kids are out there. The All the girls were out screwing down the plywood for their bedroom yep. yesterday and, and they're having a good time. But, you know, we're getting late in the season and we've got to get this thing framed up and at least dried in, which mm -hmm. means 
a house wrap on it and a roof on it before right. we start to get into rainy, cold weather. Yeah. And we got a bit of work to do. So that's really kind of dominating. Keeping an eye on the garden and, yeah. and everything else is just kind of in flow. You're handling all the inflow out of the garden. Right. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, that's the main thing. It's piling up logs for firewood, which we've got to get to splitting soon. Right. Exactly. Well, yeah. and that's such a great skill. The building is such an amazing skill for everybody to know on the homestead because yeah. you find that you're often building things. <laughs> well, and the kids, it really invests them in what we're doing, yeah. you know? And a big part of the addition is the bedrooms because we've got a large family and we've got a large house, but the kids' bedrooms were really small for Very how small. many kids are there. <laughs> and so while we're doing a few other things along with that, it's their bedrooms that really got this whole thing going. Yeah. And so for them to participate in that is just really exciting for it them is. and to be dreaming about their space and, and what they're gonna do and just, but part of the whole environment of the way we're living. Mm -hmm. they, they to For them to do that, besides building skills, just really helps them buy in and, and feel excited and feel like they're contributing. Right. And um, they all seem to really love it. Yeah, yeah. They love getting so, their hands yeah. into whatever yep. we're doing. Try right? to include them in yep. everything that we can. <laughs> Good. Yeah, all right. Well, okay, moving along. Let's get to our one question of okay. the day. This one looks like it's for you today. Okay. And uh, this is from Tracy... Brewing. Hope I said mm -hmm. that right, Tracy, from an apartment to 40 acres. Okay. And her question is, my granny's made butter from clabbered milk. Is that a fermented butter? Oh, yes. That would be a fermented butter or a cultured butter. It would just be a natural ferment, technically, because your uh, clabbered milk is where you're using the wild bacteria to culture your milk and then pulling that cream off means you have a cultured cream which means that you end up with a cultured butter and a little bit of culturing um, in that cream really makes your butter one last a lot longer because it's that fermented product mm -hmm. so it has natural protection against going bad but then too it also helps it turn to butter much more quickly and a lot of times it helps you get a better percentage of butter from your cream okay. so it's a really good thing to do. Um, we just did a butter making video not too long ago, so you can check that out on YouTube and uh, find some different ways to make butter and definitely culturing them is one of them. Very cool, yeah. great question, Tracy. And um, all right, well, let's dive in. So you've bought this new place mm. and you're excited to get going on your homesteading or country adventure, whatever your plans are, and you're, you're getting ready to move in or you're moving in. Mm -hmm. And there are really some steps that you want to take and in, in, in an order of things to help you be successful, right. minimize failures and expense. Mm -hmm. And um, so diving right in, the first one, which is going to be kind of like a no duh, but moving in. Just getting moved in. And here's what a lot of people do, okay. right? And what we've done. We you move times. in, you start unpacking, but you're you're not just moving into the house. You're going to go buy the milk cow. You're going to go start turning up the ground for a garden all at one time. Well, I think... That, sorry. Go ahead. Th this is so important of a step because so many of us, when we move out to the country, we're moving out because we're like, wow... We need to get somewhere maybe a little more stable. We want to be growing some food. We're feeling right. that urgency that culture's getting a little messy. There's a lot of strong us. motivation. There really is. And so, you know, your goal is to be growing food. So you want to get there and start growing food right away or start doing what you're planning on doing right away. And that is just a recipe for disaster. Right. So we really want to encourage you to put on the brakes right yeah. here and focus on just getting moved in. And, yeah. a, and a quick antidote, a story that, that oh, uh, we went through moving into I when am, we first moved on to 40 acres. Absolutely. Not yeah. this property, but I am last not one. a patient person. Let me just say it has taken me a lot of years to start to develop some amount of patience. <laughs> and so when we moved up to Idaho for the first time, finally moving to the homestead with the water and the land that we were yeah. looking for, I don't think we were here two weeks, and I just insisted on getting that milk cow. I don't even think it was two weeks. I, don't I, think, I think it was, it was a few days, honestly. We were not. I don't even know if we had our furniture packed because <laughs> unpacked because there was a delay in getting the moving truck here, and we had a milk cow out in the field which did not have a stanchion. It didn't have anything. It was not at all set up for it, and 
it, that ended up causing a lot of stress in the long Well, run. and you know, it's tough because you're a researcher, we're moving in, we know we want a dairy cow, so you're looking to see yeah. what's out there. And there's a great cow out there for a great cost. Yeah, grab and it And that's hard to refuse. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we were, we hadn't dealt with fences yet. We hadn't, yeah, we didn't have anything. No. I don't and, even think we had a good hay supplier for when we ran out of No, we didn't. We, we hadn't learned our area yet. We did have a bunch of grass, yeah. and we had a tree to tie or two, and we milked under the tree. It wasn't our first dairy cow, thankfully. So really, oh. don't do that if it's your first dairy cow. Right. But at least we knew how to mil hand milk already. Right. And the cow, was she was pretty good. Yeah. But that's not always the case. And so that's just piling too much on. And so to get to get back to the core of it, get moved in, get unpacked and get settled into your home and start to find your rhythm mm -hmm. um, of, of just how you're living in the house and, and observe the property and dream for a few minutes, but, but get settled in. And I think right. you had a few thoughts about inside the house, things you want to take care of as you're moving in besides Absolutely. basic unpacking. Planning how you're going to use your space is uh, very essential. And we're going to be talking about a lot of planning in this particular episode. But um, planning out how you're going to use your space is going to save you a lot of time and frustration and energy in the long run. Yeah. And so you need to think ahead as you're starting to unpack, getting your spaces kind of settled. You know, what am I going to be doing in the kitchen and set up your kitchen stations? But one that I think is really, really important and people overlook really easily is food storage areas. If you're moving out onto a piece of property because your goal is to grow food, you're going to be preserving food, mm -hmm. most likely, or bulk buying and storing food, you need to think through where you can store your food and, um, you know, kind of make that one of the priority spaces to get figured out. Well, and it is because down below here, we're going to talk about getting stocked up a little bit. Yeah. You know, even though you're planning to grow a lot of your own food, right. you, you want to get some reserves up first. Right. And so we'll get to that in a second. So, but that all ties right into right. having a place to do that, right? Well, and Organ a system. Maybe some of your move-in budget needs to be for shelving or something like that to make sure that you've oh. got your food storage spaces ready to actually receive food. That And that's a good thought from the moves we've made that I think a lot of people don't realize is you need to have an expense in there for your moving costs for exactly that. We've yeah. looked that over a multitude of times. Yeah. There's going to be shelving, especially when you're moving toward a country life mm -hmm. and a homesteading life and the different aspects of a mudroom, places to put boots and clothes, hang things, food storage, a lot of stuff like that. So you're going to be spending some money trying to customize some areas to make them work right. for this lifestyle. Yeah, you know, we absolutely. always have found ourselves doing that. It'll, it'll save you a lot yeah. of headache. <laughs> so get moved in and enjoy just walking around the property and making plans, doing some of the things we're about to talk about. But focus on getting in, getting settled, getting a routine mm -hmm. um, before you start reaching out and doing all these other projects that, that you're excited about. Let me just give a really practical, like from the woman's side angle here. Get your decorations up right now. Like pick out your curtains, <laughs> hang your curtains, get the plates and pictures on the wall. Because once you get into gardening and animals and all of that, you might not have the time to do those sorts of things. So this is a moment to yep. really settle in and get your spaces all designed, decorated and dealt with. Yeah, you're, you're going to be much more comfortable and you're going to go through a lot of things. And so having your home is that place to just, you know, stop and be happy with it and the things yeah. you enjoy around you when you're dealing with whatever struggles or failures or busyness or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really important. Yeah, I think the next one as we start to move on here mm -hmm. is really important too. And you can do this one right away. In fact, well, you should be doing this one before you even move well, in. Hopefully probably. you've, right. And this is meeting your neighbors. Yeah. And hopefully in the process of buying the property, you've you've gone and met a few of your neighbors that border your property or that you might share a road with. But if you haven't done that yet, go do that right away. Yeah. Your neighbors in a country setting are so incredibly crucial to your success mm -hmm. and your ability to handle things. If you're out in the country, you're probably a ways away from resources. Right, you're gonna be further services. out of town. Yep. Yeah, you might not have uh, the grocery store right there real quick. You might not have, uh, you know, ambulance real close. I right. know for us, it's quite a ways away or police response or all these different things. And that's where country neighbors 
become your lifeline for living out in the country. And you, yeah, you really need to know them. You may not become best friends with sure. all of them, but there's a community there that's different. Even though we're spread out further, mm -hmm. there's a different community sense than there is in, say, the suburbs yeah. or in the city. And so you really want to be checking with people. You're sharing fence lines with them. You yes. may, may be maintaining roads with them. And of course, you know, you're going to want fellowship and you're going to need to help each other out in a bind. And maybe you guys are going to find things that you're going to love working together on. Right. But really take the time right now to get your neighbors and show yourself. Mm -hmm. friendly a lot of times in the country when new people are moving in and the people that already live there don't really know who that is they're wondering who, who is this person right. is this person going to be somebody that I can rely on that I can be a friend with or are they going to be somebody that's going to be a pain mm -hmm. and that's going to be a burden and cause problems and, and and they're wondering when they're seeing new comings and goings mm -hmm. so get to know people and and build that community around you right away and don't wait for them to show up to introduce themselves right. kind of like in the old movies you know that somebody come Hopefully over with somebody a picnic brings basket your, right, plate that, of cookies or Something. That would be great. Take them a plate of cookies or a freshly made pie um, to give them some reassurance that you're going to be good neighbors and you're the country sort of person. Yeah, that you want to fit in. <laughs> yeah, and you and you want to get along and, and just be a contributor. Yes. Yeah, to, to the neighborhood, even if it's spread out. Yeah. Okay, so here's another important one. Yeah, and this is, this is one that I think especially if you've lived in the city and again, you're used to having resources really close to you and you've just moved out into the country, um, this one might take a little bit of getting used to mm -hmm. because there are things that happen out in the country that delay your access to getting things, whether that's a power outage. Mm -hmm. That happens if you have long stretches yep. of power lines and trees around them. They fall and you go without power. Snow and ice. Snow and it ice. It doesn't get cleared right away. Yeah. Maybe, you know, you just can't run down the road and grab that ingredient that you wanted for that right. special meal. So to counteract that, you need to... Make sure your access is taken care of, that you understand your access issues. When you move into the country, a lot of times you're on country roads. Well, you're going to be on country roads. Some of them may be long gravel roads that are county maintained. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you're going to be on private dirt road or gravel road that is community right. maintained. And... Um, there's different issues that you can be dealing with from, you know, seasonal flooding mm -hmm. to snow and ice to trees falling in the road and windstorms or because of snow. Yeah. And so you need to understand your access. You need to jump into the flow with your neighbors. Who's responsible for what? How can you help? And what are the issues so you're prepared for them ahead of time? How long right. does it take? Where we live, we're a little further out. We do live on a county road and generally they plow it, but it can take up to 24 hours yeah. or longer if the snow is really, really heavy. Mm -hmm. You need to build a plan for that. Are you going to need to be able to plow it to, because you've got particular reasons why you have to be able to get out? Do you need chains? There's a whole lot of things to think about in that access before you run into those problems. Mm -hmm. And of course, again, maintaining it with neighbors. And your neighbors are going to be your best resource for that. Right. And, and a great just topic of conversation as you're getting to know them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Good. Cool. Okay. So we're, we're moving through them. And next... We call this take care of your preps. Yeah. Right. This is just we've talked about this in a lot of different formats, but you want to get your your preps in right away. And, you know, we oftentimes, Josh and I, differentiate between being a prepper and being a homesteader where, you know, sometimes people come at a prepping mindset with I'm just going to get everything. It's going to be stashed in my basement and it's going to be there when there's a problem. For right. Me. Homesteaders are often out actually participating in the skills and living that way day to day. But there is a place where as a homesteader, you need to be prepared and have Always. your preps, right? You need to be ready for what's going to come your way. Yep. So it's a really important uh, part of living the lifestyle is being prepared for those power outages right. or for the lack of access to places. Yep. Un uh, just unforeseen circumstances. Mm -hmm. yeah, and first is water. That's just a yeah. basic prepping that you understand your water system and that you have backup water, however that is, whether it's storage containers, whether it's a cistern. We've mm -hmm. got an in-ground cistern that a spring feeds into that can gravity feed the house. So we're always going to have low flow water. Um, you, you know, it depends on your property, but make sure you have a plan and you know um, what you're going to do if the power goes out and you don't have a well. Yeah. You know, your well's not working for a while or, or whatever it might be. Have your water. Right. And your power. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, that leads right into power, making sure that you've got electrical backup. You're further away from things. And really, everybody should have this everywhere. But you need a backup generator of some sort. 
and you need to have backup batteries for you know your flashlights, all the different things. And we're not just really not here to go through all the details, but mm -hmm. be thinking about your power systems and that you have backups in place because. Right. When things fail, they fail at the worst time. They usually do. And so you really want these systems set up before you're diving into other projects and dealing with animal issues or garden issues or whatever it is. You, you want to get this stuff done. Absolutely. Ahead of time. Right along with that is your food. Making right. sure that you have food backups in place. We really recommend just buying the food that you are going to use anyways in bulk and just living off of your bulk food storage in a rotation system so things aren't getting old. So I don't particularly mean just buying a whole bunch of freeze dried food. I mean, buying in bulk what you're going to use anyways, getting it stored on those shelving systems that you got right when you moved in, right? Right, and one that you've been really good at good at to add to that is some convenience foods, yeah. How, however those are. I mean, you know, most of us out here are wanting to grow healthy, organic, high quality food, and that's great. We're working right. towards that. But there are times when we need convenience foods to get through a jam or an injury, a medical emergency, and whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so include in that those emergency convenience foods that's easy to get a meal together for you know several days if you need to. Yeah, absolutely for an emergency state, but also even just for those busy days, right? right. Um, I have a joke with some other good homestead friends of mine about how, you know, here we just spent a whole day canning all of this great food, <laughs> and now we really wish we could get delivery pizza. You know, it's kind of this <laughs> right? joke, like we've been doing all this great food, now we want this junk, somebody just to hand it to us. You need to have your own version of delivery pizza, whatever that is. And I love the canned foods, like home canned convenience foods are such a great way to go. You can make up a big batch of them yep. and just have them sitting in your jars on your shelf and they're just heat and eat. And that's closer. You're going to get that a lot faster than delivery pizza if you live out in the country. Absolutely. You have, probably yep. can't get it anyways. Yeah. But. Have it on your shelf. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? And then uh, your medical backup, medical supplies, basic emergency medical supplies. Obviously, you're going to be a little further out. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully you've got some knowledge and you've got some supplies to just help you deal with issues because right. there's going to be injuries. There's going to be things that are going to happen. I want to add one more to this, mm -hmm. and that is fuel. Um, when you live in the country yes. and you live out of ways, you really need to develop a habit of not running your vehicles to empty mm -hmm. before you fill up. Because honestly, even just for a medical emergency, if you have to drive from your house to an emergency room, and a lot of times if you live out in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. your best bet is not to wait for the ambulance. It's to start driving. Right. Yep. And they will tell you that in country hospitals, get in the car and start driving. Um, you don't want to have to stop and fill up on gas on the way in an emergency situation. You're right. Yeah. It, Find out you got an eighth of a tank or right. something. So make sure you're always keeping, you know, at least a quarter of a tank. Usually no, the best half or more. Best option is to fill up when you get to half. Right. And with that, all your fuel cans for your other vehicles, for your generators, your power backup, you want to try to keep things topped off all the time. So that's yeah. a great, great suggestion. Yeah. With... And again, we're not talking about end of the world scenario prepping here. <laughs> we're talking about basic living out in the country. Right. You need to just live prepared in a basic way so that you're ready for the things that country living throws at you. Right. Your resources are farther away. Yeah. They're just not right there close. And so these, these are a lot of things you can take and are part of really the moving in process and getting settled in really before you even start to think about property property and that's what we're going to start to step into here now but you really want to get these things down you're going to be a lot more settled a lot more comfortable and you're going to be ready to start reaching out doing larger projects doing new things and you've you've got a good backup you've got a good base to work from because like i tell the boys especially out there with chores it never goes wrong at a good time right. <laughs> never yeah, all right so now we've moved in we get to go get the milk cow right not yet <laughs> <laughs> okay all righty so in an ideal world and if you guys have followed us for a while you know that we study permaculture and it's it's a system of design and planning and maintaining property in an ideal world you want to spend a lot of time observing your land and thinking about how you're going to do things in planning. Mm -hmm. So really, in ideals, that's a year. But that's not reality, right? right. Um, so we've got to blend that because we've got to get in. We're going to do things. We're working with existing infrastructure. But I really want to encourage you to be observing. The whole time you're moving in while you're walking around and you're daydreaming and you're thinking about where things are going to go, 
be observing, observing weather patterns and what's growing, what's not, the land, the soil, how the sun moves, just how your property works and take time to observe. Even as you start to take action and plan, always be observing. And then as you're taking exact taking action, observe the effects of that and what you need to adjust. And so that's really important to have that mindset right from the get go, not to just get in there and do and, and buy the milk cow right. or buy the chickens and just throw it up right here because it looks like a good place. Mm -hmm. you, you need to start working on a whole plan. Well, and I think that's so important because you may have viewed your property before you bought it and you may be already living in it for a little bit of time. But you're probably, you know, that that window of time is narrow, that mm -hmm. that can all happen in. So you may not know that you've got a low spot right over there that's going to get really muddy and turn into a seasonal pond part of the year, yeah. right? And then you go put your chicken coop right there. You've got problems right off. Right. And so you want to spend as much time as you can watching your property, see what happens in different areas and be aware while that's happening. You really do. And it seems easy to just go look and lay things out. But as a guy that's um, built homes all my life, been on land, worked on large areas of land and planning and then studied permaculture, even coming onto this property here, mm -hmm. my mind's turning. And w with, you know, in a month of, of buying our property, I, I feel like I've got things figured out right. in my head and where everything would work. But we're, we're two years in and I'm still going, okay, I didn't know that. All right, I got to adjust there. Mm -hmm. And you're always learning. So it's an ongoing process. And the more of that, the more you can be aware of that and the more of a plan you have, but yet knowing you're going to adjust over time, uh, the more successful you're going to be, the less money you're going to waste, the less time you're going to waste, mm -hmm. and less troubles you're going to have. Okay, so... And one more on that we didn't cover is studying permaculture. Mm -hmm. Permaculture is a great resource and um, just a great method to help you do all this planning and organizing of how you're going to operate on the property. Right. So a major part of this learning about per permaculture as it applies to a property design is zoning. And I right. think this is really, really important. It's kind of what we talked about back in the moving mm -hmm. in area that you can move into your house in a way that makes you always having to scramble and do more work, mm -hmm. right? Or you can move in and set up your areas in a way that makes your everyday movement much more efficient so you can get a lot more right. done with the same time. Your property is the exact same. And um, permaculture really addresses this from a design perspective mm -hmm. of making sure that you have the things that you access multiple times a day really close around your house. That would be considered zone one. Right, your high intensity use areas. And, yeah, yep. it's where you're coming and going. That's why you want your kitchen garden, your veg, your herb garden mm -hmm. right outside your door if you can. Some of your vegetable garden. Some of your veggies that you're going to get to every day, like your salad veggies, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, those things that you're going to access daily, maybe multiple times a day, needs to be right near you. And then you go out to zone two, which is a little mm -hmm. bit further away, and those are... Uh, daily well, you're, access or almost right, daily still access. once daily access it can be right on the edge and it may be more than once but it's once to daily you know access and so your barn might be right there you mm -hmm. might not want it that close in zone one but it's right on the edge uh, a lot of your orchards are zone one mm -hmm. or i'm sorry zone two maybe going into zone three excuse me and um, so that we don't go all the way through it, right. there, there's about five zones, and this is just really something to study and be aware of. And all you're trying to do is create efficiencies, right. right, of movement, economy of movement, so that where you spend the most time, it's closer to you, where you spend the least time or, or, or very little time at all, like say your woods or areas maybe that you're going to leave wild, mm -hmm. those are generally going to be the furthest out, not always, and that's a whole design discussion. There's mm -hmm. a lot to talk about, but, but take some time to get familiar with that type of planning, and it's really, really going to help you out. It is going to save you a a lot of time, a lot of energy in the long run if you can take some time on that. So that just goes back to that take your time and plan mm -hmm. out your property. Don't just jump in and start doing. And I think it's really valuable to plan out the like ideal long-term property, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, be flexible. Mm -hmm. A property plan is kind of like a budget. You've got your ideal, you're going to set your goals. Yeah. And then as you move through it, you're going to you're going to observe and then you're going to flex and adjust, but you want that plan to work from. And and I, I wish just from being somebody that's consulted and worked with new homes that people had a whole property plan from the get-go, even if it has to change over time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it saves you a lot of headache later. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, let me just say that if you're working on this with a spouse or other family members, 
sitting down and working this out on paper before you're actually going is going to save you a lot mm -hmm. of headache, maybe yep. a lot of argument, maybe a lot of frustration in the long term. <laughs> we don't ever argue. Just so no, you know. Not at all. No. <laughs> but that way you're all on the same page. And so you kind of have your moment to work out those frustrations or those difference of opinions before you're actually in the process doing something um, and the other person has a different opinion. So it's a great way to just create other efficiencies as mm -hmm. well. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Okay. So getting into a little bit of the fun part, right? What right. everybody's ready to dive into right away. Gardens yeah. and animals, two of the core elements of a homestead as we move outside of the house. Yeah. And so let's talk gardens a little bit. Same thing. You want to plan. Yeah. Don't just go throw it down. Uh, you want to come up with a plan and think about what you're growing and why and where it's going to go and how you're what you're going to do with it when you harvest it. Mm -hmm. And we've got plenty other videos on, on those right. topics, but Absolutely. start with a plan. Start with a plan. Yeah, I was going to add to that. Think about pests and problems that you're going to have protecting right. your garden, um, because in a lot of places you just throw it out on the lawn or the, you know, the front yard and then the deer will come in and completely eat it if you don't right. have it protected. So just think through it all the way. And the other one is soil. Almost anywhere that you're going to be going, your soil is going to be degraded. Mm -hmm. And so you need to have a plan to improve that soil. Right. And you know, if you're on low budget, it can be as simple as just realizing you're going to bring in the best quality compost you can and organic material and hopefully some mulching material. You can check out some videos that I do on, on um, no-tilling, which mm -hmm. is just the way I would really encourage you to go. If you want to dive a little deeper, uh, do some tests. It's always a good idea to do some tests, some basic um, pH tests and or understanding organic material. If you want to go further, you can get into mineralization. Um, you know, do what you can to create a plan, but really understand your soil and plan to be improving it. It takes three to four years uh, to get a garden really humming, to right. really get the soil built up and the soil biology uh, working to where it's highly productive. So just knowing that helps mm -hmm. and have a plan to, to work on that. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, last, but certainly not least, animals. And we Ooh. can't cover every single animal, but there's no. some general things, again, to be thinking about depending on what kind of animals is it is that you're going to be working on. Right. And I'm, again, number one guilty probably here of like finding that great deal on that animal that I really wanted anyways, you know, and not. Talking me into going and getting it when I'm exactly. going, but, but, but the fence. <laughs> oh, we'll take care of the fence later. Let's just get the okay, here, sweetie. Please. I just want you to have what you want. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> it causes a lot of headaches. So right. Make sure you think through what you're going to do. And again, the number one step for any of these projects is plan. Yep. Take some time. Know what you need. Know the requirements of the animal that you're thinking about bringing onto the property. Yep. Know so, their housing needs and get those things in place. Right. So a few of those I was going to mm -hmm. go through them. Okay. Housing. How are you going to house the animal? And that okay. all determ is determined on the animal in your environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, how you know what's their yard, their pen, their pasture, and the fencing that goes with that. Gates. Mm -hmm. Make sure that stuff is all in order. Uh, obviously, water. Make sure you have a plan yes. for water. If you're going to go through winter, how are you going to get them water in the winter? Yeah. Be thinking about those things and planning it out. And then feed. What feed do they need? How are you going to store it? Uh, if you're in a winter environment, and really even if you're not, it's always best to bulk buy even with animal feed mm -hmm. and not be running back and forth every week. That right. is a stressor. Right. Um, so have a plan to store all of that and get it to the animals. Hopefully that's close. Sometimes that doesn't always work. So you need to have a plan there. And then lastly. Mm -hmm. Sorry. What? I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Thought you'd <laughs> pick that up. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you know why? Because this is one that, that even we don't think about a lot. Your vet. Yes. Get to know a vet when you move into an area. Just find out where they're at. You have their number written down. Mm -hmm. You're going to have animals. You're going to have issues. You're going to need a vet at some point. And if you have local either neighbors or friends who have animals, or even if you're buying an animal locally, ask them what vet they use and right. if they have liked them. Get, get opinions. Well, it's, it's getting that referral, yep. right? It's easy to totally overlook that. And then you've got a problem, you know, at nine o'clock on Friday night and you don't have a vet's number. You don't know who to call. You can't get a hold of your neighbors and you're scrambling. You've got an issue. You, you want that number on the wall. You know the guy or gal to call and, and uh, get there and help you out. And let me guarantee your animal problems, just like your child health <laughs> problems, will come someplace just past five or six p.m. on Friday evenings. Yeah. 
<laughs> Absolutely. When the water line is broke. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you don't yeah. have anything in the fridge for dinner. Right. So yep. <laughs> be prepared and you'll save yourself a lot of headache and a lot of time in the long run. And you'll be able to enjoy the projects that you do take on a lot more and get a lot more uh, production out of them. Return on your investment of energy, time and money. And uh, it'll be a lot better experience if you take a little bit of time and do some planning to begin with. Absolutely. So enjoy the journey. Thanks for hanging with us here. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.